Graham and created the original skinny jeans workout that sold over 100,000 units in Target and Walmart. She's been featured in Life and Style Magazine, KTLA 5, CBS News, Thrive Global, WebMD, and has 20 plus years transforming clients' lives, including Cheryl Teagues and Paul Zane Pilzer, who I happen to know. We'll have to talk about that oh in a minute. Oh my God, I love that. He's such a wonderful human. He changed my life. I should, I should tell you that story. Uh, he's that but, kind of person. Yeah, he, he's always, always a wonderful guy. Yeah, and um, I'm going to read a little bit more of your bio and let's talk about that. But Lisa is recognized as an expert VIP lifestyle coach, creating customized nutrition and exercise plans for clients to combat sleep deprivation, stress, and unhealthy eating. And so you've got this great resume. You've been doing this a long time. You've worked with some influential people. And uh, before we jump into the Paul Zane Pilser story, <laughs> let's hear a little bit more about you first. Where did you start? How did you get interested in this and then go on to create these great programs and, and do the coaching you're doing? Well, thanks for that question, Dave. I've actually never really known any other career in my whole life. I started at the beginning of jumping up and down, teaching exercise classes and running. And I've, I'm actually a pretty anxious type of person. So I think I gravitated towards exercise from the beginning, because it calms me down. It just like, hmm. if I ever feel anxious and stressed, if I jump up and down for a few minutes, it just calms me down. So I've just always been passionate about fitness. And I always saw a huge future in fitness. And now weight loss and now coaching for VIPs. I just think I've always been in the same industry, but it just changes all the time. Who were some of your early influences? Wow. I love, um, actually, I remember back in the day, like, I obviously love Tony Horton and um, the Beachbody, you know, just like all of yeah. those coaches. Um, I remember even Jane Fonda when she first came out with um, all that exercises and, you know, all the funny people like dancing around in, in tights. And I was all influenced by that. And I was like, I love to move. You know, yeah. just it morphs and changes, whether it's like spinning or running or teaching classes back in the day to now coaching high level executives. I really feel like I have a message to share and I'm just passionate about longevity as I get older and my clients get older. It's not just about the vanity metrics anymore. It's all about the value add that fitness can bring to your life. Interesting. And I want to, in, in your career, you've also, you named some of those people, some of those programs, which I'm familiar with. And, and not only does the fitness industry morph, it does improve too. We know so much more than we did back then. What would you say are some of the biggest improvements in exercise science that you've seen in your career? Well, the funny thing is like some of those like trendy trends, like I think that we, that we can move past the thigh master and it served a purpose and all of the easy buttons where I've been fallen victim to every single crazy diet there ever was mm -hmm. in my whole life. You know, I will be a guinea pig and try whatever it is. And I think we've come full circle. Although I do support a lot of nutri nutritional products. I think now it's not about the fats and the crazy diets. It's about, we've been through a crazy couple of years here mm -hmm. and never has health and wellness both mental and physical been more important it's like we're going on a third year here of insanity so right. i i think that we're changing now it's a necessity mm. having a healthy mindset and healthy body and a healthy diet is a necessity now that we've all seen the people the comorbidities who were more prone to even getting COVID. Obesity was a huge comorbidity. Right, right. And uh, uh, I, I agree with that. And, and, and one of the early things we learned was that the weaker your system and the lower your level of health, the more at risk you were. It was just, uh, just like a mathematical equation. Yeah. Uh, and so it really did. And then we learned about the vitamin D thing. The relationship between if your vitamin D was low, and we know 76% of Americans have low vitamin D, and then predictably, our 
our, our great medical professionals kind of tried to just ignored all of that. And I, I understand from a social policy point of view that, you know, getting people to do the easiest thing does make sense. I, I understand that. Not everyone is going to start a fitness program. If they're not ready for it, people have to be ready for a thing. Um, but it, it was frustrating to me that we didn't have more official acknowledgement of the value of improving your immune system, of getting your vitamin D up, of starting a program. I think that was a major missed opportunity at governmental levels. It was sad. You know, I think there were so many of us in the wellness space that felt victimized by this pandemic and felt mm. like here we are doing anything and everything to take care of our immune system and the mental and emotional benefits of exercise are so well documented. It's the right. best mood booster there is. So with everybody, I'd say at least four out of 10 people struggling with their mental health and their physical health even more so. It's crazy that the CDC didn't recommend exercise, meditation, other stress relief, um, getting support, physical exercise, all kinds of nutritional stuff. It's crazy that they actually closed down the gyms, the one place where people could actually boost their immune system. Yeah, it's interesting. And uh, of course, luckily, people listening to a podcast like mine or like yours generally are the people that already already know this. Uh, and yet, uh, I know from polling my customers that weight loss is still a struggle. It's not easy. Um, obesity is one of those comorbidities. And obesity is uh, defined, at least by the American Heart Association, as 20 pounds of excess fat. So if we go by that metric, if you're overweight by 20 pounds or more, uh, you're considered obese, not morbidly obese, but obese. And uh, unfortunately, obese people were at much higher risk um, uh, of COVID. Now, that can be, it can sound very, very judgmental and harsh. There are a lot of people, Lisa, and I know you know this, that are 20 to 50 pounds overweight or whatever the number is that don't want to be. And they're frustrated because in some cases they're doing a lot of the right things. I see this all the time. I don't know if this is something you come across, but but I definitely see a massive difference, whether it's metabolism or stress management or a combination. I just don't know. All I know is some people lose weight the minute they decide to, they just start a plan and it just, they just shed it. It's just, it just goes away. Right. And then other people, it's harder. And other people, it's bizarrely hard. Like they can do the right things for a long time and not lose the weight. And so uh, let's talk about weight loss and all that difficulty that comes along with it. You're in the weight loss field. You know, you're the founder of the skinny jeans workout that helped a lot of people lose weight. Tell me your experience with that. And, and, um, and let's ignore those people who can lose the weight easily because they know what to do. Let's talk Absolutely. to those people. It's a little tougher for. Well, first of all, those people are men. Um, I'm just going to tell you straight, <laughs> straight right here. Mm. I have so much of an easier time getting men to lose weight than women. And, Interesting. and I don't want anybody to be offended by this on this show. I'm not sexist or anything like that. And I'm not judging you if you have weight to lose. But I have systems in place where I can help people lose weight. But a lot of times you're not tracking. So if weight loss is a goal and you're saying nothing works, you need to have a lot of data to support you and a coach to hold you to the highest level of accountability that you can send your data to on a weekly basis because all systems work when you work them. And then if you're not getting support, you might not know that if it didn't work, you got to try something else. It's like what when you're teaching a new baby to walk. You're not going to just say, oh, forget it. That baby's never going to walk. Weight loss is one of those frustrating things. You, you hit plateaus. And there's all of these people, and I've felt them, their pain about being able to create social distance from the fridge and all that kind of stuff because we've all been way too close to the fridge. So how do you remedy that? All plans work when you work them. I am obsessed with intermittent fasting and intermittent nutritional fasting. Those strategies work, but it's hard work. 
And in order to accomplish anything great in life, because my road to success has never been a straight road. It's been more like bumpy road. And um, you got to do the hard things. And fasting is not easy, but you have to drink enough water. You got to pick a plan that works and you got to get support along the journey and never give up on your goals. And if I might add to that too, why do you want to lose weight? Start with why. Yeah, it, that's interesting you bring that up. My, my certification in nutrition is through Precision Nutrition. And the first thing they have us do with a new client is do the five whys. Have you heard of that? Yeah, yeah. That's yeah, yeah. From like Toyota Motor Company originally, they um, turned it around. This guy, um, Toyota, turned Toyota Motor Company around by getting to the five layers deep why. You want to get to the why that makes you cry of why do you want this? It can't be I want to look hot on the beach. It could be more like, why do you want to look hot on the beach? Well, because I'm single and I don't want to, I want to attract the right guy. And well, why do you want to attract the right guy? Well, because I don't want to spend the rest of my life alone. And why do you not want to spend, so keep going like, well, because yeah. I want someone to witness my life and share it with me. So that is something like a five layer why. Okay. Well, let's, let's jump into it and say that we've got a person who knows their why, they've got their plan, they follow it, and now they start to hit obstacles. It starts to get tough, it gets, gets, gets challenging. Do you have some tricks of the trade or some suggestions or ideas? We, we know there's going to be plateaus. Of course. There's always going to be plateaus on that bumpy road to success. Um, don't start too big. I would say it's good to have short, medium, and long-term goals. And it's try try to not do it all at once. So let's say in three months from now, you want to lose 10 pounds. You already know your what and you know your why. So you want to make sure it's a smart goal, specific, measurable, attainable, realistic, time bound. So then you got to reverse engineer that goal for the short term goal. What is your first step? I find, I'm sure you know this is true and would agree with me that most people are insanely dehydrated. Uh, yeah, the number one, the number one thing we teach in our, uh, our, our protocol that we give people in weight loss is called the Darby, the Darby Undiet, which is seven simple principles of health. And number one is drink more water. <laughs> number one. Yeah. So you know your what, you know your why, you know your 90-day time frame. So then you can chunk that down into smaller time frames. Like every single week, you should be weighing yourself if weight loss is a goal. Start with some metrics that don't include the scale because the scale is not always our friend. So what is your waist measurement? What is your hips measurement? What are your tricep measurements? Pick like one or two or three areas where you're going to notice a difference. And it might not just be on the scale. And if, if possible, get a scale that also measures body fat and BMI so that you're not just going by the scale. So I'd say, you know your what, you know your why, you know your short-term goal, you know your long-term goal, you're tracking along the way with before photos, waist measurements, body fat composition, and you never give up on your dream big goal. So when I have a big dream big goal, which I focus on goals all the time, I focus on them first thing in the morning when I wake up, when my, my mind hasn't really started to freak out yet or wake up. That's when I do my morning mindset routine and focus on what I want and why and how. And then at night before I go to bed, I'll focus on it again. Do you do that every day? Yeah, I'm totally into my morning routine. I first started listening um, when I made this commitment to myself. Um, to Dr. Joe Dispenza, and that really helped me. Instead of focusing on what already happened yesterday or what's going to happen tomorrow, being present in the present moment, and what can I do today to take one small step? Can I drink half of my body weight in ounces of water? Can I move my body for 10 minutes every day this week and maybe 15 minutes next week and maybe the following week 20 Try to find chunks of stuff you can do one step at a time, one week at a time. And those are just like habits you can stack upon each other. So because the first week you accomplish the water, then you have a good 
sense of that I accomplished something, then you can stack the walking on top of that. And you could add maybe a little more duration on top of that. And then it, it's, it really comes down to the food. Before we get to the food, I'm also a big fan of intermittent fasting, but I don't work as closely with clients as you do. Uh, we are a supplement seller. We have dirobi.com. We have a lot of people that buy supplements from us and we do provide as much information as we can. But unfortunately, I, I don't have a lot of one-on-one -on -one interaction with people. And I know you train, you know, high achieving people to be successful. And so you're working one-on-one -on -one with these people. And I, I, I wonder how much success do you have training people on intermittent fasting? Do you find that they find it hard or is it fairly easy how are your clients adopting intermittent fasting? Uh, um, what, what is, I didn't phrase the question very well, but I mean, how difficult have you found it to be for most people? Well, again, just to be 100% honest, um, men find it incredibly easy. They get amazing results. For women, there's a lot more emotions involved because, you know, we mess with our own hormones by not eating certain amounts of times. So there's moodiness that can happen with intermittent fasting. So for women, I would say, just like you start small with any goal, maybe instead of the 16 protocol, which is the one I follow, I'm assuming you probably do too. Um, maybe you can do 14 and 10, like just skip breakfast. It, the dogma of the old dogma that, that that's the most important meal of the day is not just not true anymore. I skip yeah. breakfast all the time. You can have coffee, you can have tea, you can have water. And then stay busy. It's harder to fast when you're constantly thinking, where's my next meal? You got to keep your mind occupied otherwise. And then it's like amazing things happen within your body. It's not even just about weight loss at that point. There's autophagy happening where you're getting cellular regeneration so you're fighting aging and disease. So I would say start small with intermittent fasting, and then we can talk about the food. Do you know, I had a real eye-opening interview last week with Dr. Joseph Antoon. He's with Walter Longo at, down oh, at USC. Yeah. I love his work. Okay, fantastic. Well, well Dr. Antoon was ph phenomenal. And I, I kind of pushed him on this issue because all the early studies on intermittent fasting were done on men. All of them. And for whatever reason, health scientific studies, it's easier to find a group of men than women. I'm not sure why that is, but I understand that many of the studies that are done, guys are more likely to show up for many of them. And what happens is then they do the study, they publish it, and they don't specify that this was only done on men. They just announce, oh, when this group of men ate within a six hour, they don't say the men, this group of people ate within a six hour window and the group that didn't, didn't lose any weight. And this group lost 17 pounds in eight weeks. And people listen to that. Now, now, meantime, a lot of the research has come out more recently on women. And of course, there's a difference between childbearing year, uh, women in their childbearing years, just menopausal women, etc. And he is convinced that for both men and women, that 12 hours is a great number. I, and I said to him, well, but don't, don't you get more of the autophagy? Don't you have more, you know, destruction of the viruses and the pathogens and the toxins, you know, and bacteria, if you just go that much longer? He's like, I don't have any scientific data to show that. He says, we're seeing that 12 hours is an effective number. So I was really intrigued because, as you know, Victor Longo and his group, I mean, he's a top 50 worldwide health expert. He's got the only patent on longevity on the planet, as far as I know. And so uh, I think that might be really a, a big relief uh, as you describe this and the difficulty and that it's more difficult for uh, most women that you work with than men. It could be that relaxing on that eating window could, could uh, give a lot of bang for the buck and make it a lot easier. Yeah, but uh, to me, it's just a start. I know he's way more qualified to have an opinion on that than, than I am, but I listen to a lot of experts too, like Dave Asprey and David Sinclair and um, a lot of people that I follow do a longer fast, but they're all men. So I think you got to start yeah. where you're at and realize that with hormones, you got to be careful not eating and not having the proper as you provide nutritional support along the journey. It is difficult, but you do have to do hard things. You might have to, Start with 1410, but in my 
opinion, and I'm not a doctor, I would say increase the length of your fast over time. To where? The 16-8? Do you think that's Yeah, 16-8. Okay. I mean, 14-10 is, is great. There's a lot of experts I've read that say that, and there's a lot of experts that I follow that 16-8, and I'm living proof that it's possible. I mean, there, are there times when I'm hungry? Yes, but I fast for 16-8 most of the time. I do too. And I've experimented personally with shorter time frames. I've done four hours. I've done five. I've done six. And at the end of the day, I, I find that um, I don't feel like I get any bang for the buck. I feel like an eight hour eating window for me personally is fantastic. I try to finish all my food by about six o'clock. If it bleeds into 630, that's okay. But I try to really be careful about never eating after seven. That's one of the things I've discovered personally is that um, having a good gap of time uh, between finishing my last food and going to bed is really important for how well I sleep. And so my personal experimentation bears that out. And I think the science on it bears it out too. And it's pretty reasonable. You know, Absolutely. Yeah, we can fight the negative effects of aging, look younger, feel better for longer by doing the hard things, which is not easy. You know, just stay distracted get build up to 20 minutes of exercise, build up to half of your body weight in ounces of water and build up to 16, eight. And the things that happen inside your body make it all worthwhile. And are you suggesting that for women? Uh, and, and we're here, we're talking about 18 years and up, of course. So we, this is not a show for kids, but grown ups, 18 and yeah. older. Are you recommending the same thing for women, say 18 to 40 years old? Or is there differences along the way or adjustments that you would, you would. Well, make. I'm over 40. So I'm recommending this in general for everybody. And that's just, I'm sure, you know, you can't recommend the same program for everybody because if you have any history of disordered eating or any kind of medical condition with like low blood sugar, low blood pressure, you know, obviously I can't recommend fasting to you. So it, it might be something you might get your doctor's, um, approval on. And I, I, for me, I'm living proof that it works over 50 and, and I feel great and, and it's not always easy, but I feel accomplished. I feel like when you set a goal and it's hard that you have to do the hard things because then you feel more self-confident because you had the self-discipline and you were able to set a goal and it was hard and you did it. And you should be able to lose one and a half pounds a week. Okay, so great. We've talked about intermittent fasting. You've talked about water. You've talked about exercise. You've talked about some mindset things that were really great. Uh, what else nutritionally? I kind of cut you off there. You're just about to get into some nutritional stuff, and, we, I, I, and we, we talked a little more about intermittent fasting. So let's get back to nutrition. Water is your number one. You've already stated that. You've also stated half your body weight in ounces, something I totally agree with as a, as a certified fitness coach. What's your next best and, and other health tips that you give? Well, for you've, heard nutrition? It, you've heard it a million times because it works. But if you eat a lot of carbs and, and processed foods and things that are full of sugar, you will gain weight as opposed to losing it. So my recommendation is to eat less carbs, more healthy fat, more healthy protein, and just Take the things that have to be in a box and then you have to rip them open, the processed foods, and, and get those out of your diet. And aging can be reversed. The information for your body to still be young again still exists in your DNA. So we're all born with a perfect set of genetic information. And here's how to fix it, okay? To lose weight, you want to reduce your calories, eat clean, Fill your plate with veggies, um, soups and salads, and write this down. You're not eating enough protein. So protein is your building block of muscle. So those are my suggestions. I love it. It's very simple. Um, now, easier said than done. Back to your hard things that you've mentioned several times. Uh, for me, I have a sweet tooth. That's my weakness in, in nutrition. 
And so I've tried, and I also don't like zero, I, I don't like zero sum thinking. I don't, I, I believe in some moderation. So personally, what I found works for me is I have treat day. I'm allowed to have treats one time a week. And so I try to stick to that pretty aggressively. And I find that if I limit treats to one time a week, I do okay. I can reach my goals. I can be at my ideal body weight. I can have the kind of health that I like. Um, but if you're to try to do full on keto and be in ketosis, it's you know, never sugar. You can never have sugar. Are you a ketosis fan? Do you try to get in and stay in ketosis and do that with your clients as well? Or is it more simple, just as you described it, just less sugary foods, healthy proteins, lots of veggies, uh, or are you more on the, the lines of uh, being in ketosis? Oh, that's a fantastic question, Dave. I mean, I, I think keto works, but I don't find it to be sustainable, at least not for myself. Like I find if I try to eat really super low carb all week, there'll be at least one day when I'm craving carbs and, and I listen to my body and I'm not a perfectionist. I'm a recovering perfectionist on mm -hmm. a lot of things, I like that. <laughs> but I don't, I am like people that know me are going to be like, yeah, she's not perfect. I am so far from perfect. If I go out, if I want to have whatever, I don't deprive myself. But I would like to say 85% of the time I'm okay. And then 15% of the time I allow myself grace to be able to enjoy my life. Well, I mean, you sent me images that we're going to use in the podcast. And for those of you that uh, want to see the, um, the what we call quotables and quotes and links to all of Lisa's stuff, uh, that's at blog.dairobi.com. It'll be published a few weeks after the episode. And, and we've got pictures of Lisa. Uh, one is a kettlebell pose. And, and Lisa, your body fat is low. You're lean. You, you live what you teach. You can fit in your skinny jeans. Right? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. And, and you're athletic. You have an athletic look. Now I know from experience, and I know uh, from um, my my coaching, and everything that that's not easy. You can't cheat very much to have low body fat and to have that very lean athletic look. And so let's just I'm just going to push you on this. So so how much you've said you know you'll have what a dessert at dinner or something, but you can't be having too many. I mean, give me give me an average week. How much? And I don't like the word cheat. Let's call it a treat. Okay. Okay. You're not cheating. You're doing the normal, healthy human thing of having a treat. Okay. Well, I like keeping it real. Okay. I'll be real with you. If I go out and have, like, I went out Friday night, I had steak, a lobster, and drinks, and a dessert, the scale went up. And the problem is, I did that two or three times last week. So then the scale, the last couple of weeks, I went out three times both weeks. I saw it moving in an upward direction, but because I know what I'm doing, I don't stress. You know, I don't think you mm -hmm. can just have one cheat day all the time. If I want to look the way I look in my photos and represent that I know what I'm talking about, that I'm living the talk, walking the talk, I know how to correct those little slip ups. And it's just life. It's just, it happens. And I'm not always going to be one weight. There's like really like a three to five pound fluctuation. And when I see it slipping up in the wrong direction, then I have to course correct and um, eat less, exercise more. And I'm just human like the rest of us. Yeah. And, and fluctuating three to five pounds within the course, even of a week is perfectly normal, even in the course of a day, sometimes. It can happen, but uh, it sounds like uh, two to three times a week is a lot for you. That typically, yeah, over the course typically of maybe one or two, one or two. Okay, but I, I really made a vow to myself after the pandemic that I wanted to have all the stuff that I teach other people. You know, more of a the elusive work life balance and more of a life and more fun. So I make an effort to go out once or twice a week. Okay, cool, and you can do that and maintain your level of health. And, and like I said, if the scale goes up, then I crack down. Now talk to me about crack down. Uh, let's say you, and, and by the way, I, the, the, the drinks might be worse than the, than the dessert, right? The alcohol is a killer. Um, and so you've gone out on a Friday night, you have partied, 
Now, next day, is there a next day course correction? And if so, what does that look like? Well, to me, it's usually, and it's always been this way my whole life, Monday is course correction day. So any slip ups usually happen on the weekend. So by Monday, I used to feel when I was maybe 10 pounds heavier than I am right now, and I'm really struggling with my own weight. As somebody who's a professional, I felt like people would look at me and judge me and like, look at her belly. And so for me, I'm hyper vigilant by Monday and drinking the water, eating less, eating clean. I do a cleanse maybe once a week where I, I'm eating a lower calorie that one day and mm -hmm. detoxing my body because I don't hardly ever eat gluten or sugar because or even like dairy i eat it but it's not good for me um so i feel the effects of my body and have to detoxify on a regular basis because as i've gotten older i have so much more food intolerances hmm. especially okay. sugar sugar's not good for me or anybody so the dessert was the big slip up the drinks i can you know i don't usually drink a lot like me one or two days a week i'll have one or two drinks but Okay. You know, nobody's perfect. I, I don't want anyone to think that I'm perfect. No, and that's why I appreciate you being very open about this. And uh, on the one hand, I think you've been very real. And and I do want people to hear this. That, but but on the other hand, a lot of people are having these sugar retreats every single day. And so, and this is just the thing that I that I knew. And what I was saying about this maintaining the athletic lean uh, look. If that's the thing that people want, we just know from the science that the treats have really got to be minimal and that for those people thinking that they can have them daily and still reach their goals, I don't think it's going to happen. I, I think we have to have 80 to 90% of our meals, which means only if, if we're 90%, then that means only one in 10 meals can be a slip up, right? So there's not a lot of, uh, of room there, but again, it goes back to the why. And I, and so again, not everyone, um, uh, you know, wants or, or is in the fitness industry like yourself and feels that way that, oh, I have to be at my best all the time. And you you put yourself to quite a high standard. So for those of you listening, it's, hey, after you go through your whys and whatever it is you're trying to achieve, just embrace it and, and, and go for it. Now, I want to also ask you some specifics. So you're eating this healthy way. You're, you're avoiding um, uh, gluten and um, sugar uh, for the most part. Again, not being not, not not suffering with perfectionitis, but those are a couple of rules you follow. And that being said, what are some of your favorite meals? Well, healthy I like meals. to cook, but I like to hack recipes and make them healthier, and mm. I like to make them fast. So I, I love things that are semi homemade. Like for example, okay. I'll buy like a bag of frozen shrimp and cook it up really quickly, or I'll do meal prep and just prep a bunch of healthy stuff and keep it in the fridge. So I love to make um, turkey meatballs and, and obviously not a vegetarian. I, I love um, cauliflower mash. I love roasted shrimp. I love butter. Like I really like real butter and real olive oil on my vegetables and I love vegetables. So when I'm really nailing it, it's really about protein and vegetables. I love salad, salad so good. I found this great recipe when I was traveling last summer in, in the Hamptons in New York, visiting my family when I had um, chopped salmon with dill and add an avocado to that. And I love that as a snack, put it on top of a salad, maybe with some arugula. So meal prep. Yeah. It sounds like it, it's a lot of work, but it's not really, you just have to make a list and buy a few things in the store that, you know, are they can become your signature dish. Like maybe the chopped up smoked salmon, um, if you're a member of my tribe or whatever you like. You can have the turkey meatballs if you're not a vegetarian or you can make those obviously with um, vegetarian protocols. And salads are great. You can get like mason jars and prep some salads and just um, I have my clients like prep their water in the morning, like line them up like soldiers. I don't know if you can see this one, but yeah, I, yeah. Um, I, I make myself follow the rules that I give others. So yeah. it's hydration first thing in the morning before I get any food. Yeah. You know, I, I used to uh, just avoid meal prep. I used to just not want to do it. I don't know why. 
I wish I wouldn't have avoided it so long. The, the key for me was when my sister taught me about the Instant Pot. Oh, then. She made a meal for, for us in the Instant Pot. And there's a lot of leftovers, which we put in the fridge. And, and that inspired me. That, oh, okay. It's, it's not harder to make a huge batch. Like it's as easy to make a huge batch as a small batch, right? By the time you get in the kitchen, and you pull everything out, it might take a little bit longer to, 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 to cut that many more sweet potatoes or whatever it is going in your recipe. But I now have two instant pots and, and wow. on a Saturday or a Sunday, they're usually both going and my, it's really changed my health life. It really has. Cause there's always something healthy in the fridge or the freezer that I can just grab. And so I've become, I, I'm an, I'm a reluctant convert to meal prep, but and chicken now that I'm doing it, I love it. I love to prep chicken thighs, like roast vegetables and thighs together because it all tastes really good. And um, it, it's just, here's a hack for you guys. It, if you don't like to eat the same thing all the time, which I don't really mind, like when I prep my food, not all that finicky, but some people don't, just you prepare it in different ways. Like let's say you have your basic chicken over here or whatever your protein source is, then just make it taste different every day. How? Well, you can just prepare it differently. Let's say you buy um, a roasted chicken from the store. You can shred it all up. You can put it on a salad. You can add like taco flavor to it and you can make a lettuce wraps or gluten-free tacos. And then you can um, just have it on the side with vegetables and you can add pesto to it or spices to it to just change the flavor or hot sauce. Like, condiments go a long way in in just changing up shaking it up once you have your basic protein or even like steak you can put it in salad you can have it with vegetables you can have it with your sweet potatoes that you've prepped so it's just spice things up find your spices that you like and then google you know pinterest is a great source of recipes if you guys right. are familiar with it cool and and let me tell you something about chicken okay uh in the Instant Pot, I, I buy whole chickens. Okay? If you take a whole organic chicken and you put it in the Instant Pot, you cook it six minutes per pound. So let's say I got a six-pound chicken. Wow. Put, put it in the Instant Pot. Yeah, six minutes per pound. So 36 minutes later, well, it takes a while to pressure up, pressure up, okay? Then it cooks it for those 36 minutes. Then I take it out, let it cool, strip all the meat off it. I put all the bones back in with all the ingredients for broth and oh. I make a chicken broth, right? So I put it back on for three hours, a little vinegar, salt, bay leaves, uh, some, some carrots, onions, garlic. And I make a huge thing of, of chicken broth, which I then use to prep next meals. And that one little thing, and guess what? The whole chicken is way cheaper. Uh, so, so for the, the cost conscious uh, shopper, Right. Buying the whole chicken and then just throwing it in your instant pot saves a lot of money on your grocery bill and allows you to have a lot of chicken available all the time. I make my dog food. So my, my dog is totally spoiled. I make oh, her food. I love she, it. Yeah. She has a whole food diet with 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 chicken and rice and vegetables. And a, it's a recipe I found at the American uh, Kennel Club. And uh, same thing. Make it up in the instant pot. It's not that hard. And uh, one chicken uh, with the other ingredients lasts her two weeks. Wow. It yeah. doesn't go bad. Do you have to freeze a few portions? I, I, I have the little Tupperware uh, containers. I have tons of those. Yeah. And uh, one batch, the full instant pot pot, which I think is six quarts. Does that sound right? Yeah. Um, that makes 14 dog meals for my size dog. Oh, for the dog. I get it. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And then I, so I get 14 of those little containers and then I put, 11 of them in the freezer oh. and three of them in the door of the fridge. And so I, I've always have an, a thawed one. You know what I mean? So I'm taking one out of the freezer and putting it in line and taking the thawed one <laughs> and feeding her uh, morning and night. So that says a lot about your character, that you're a good person, the way you take care of your dog so well. <laughs> oh, I love my dog too much. I, I <laughs> She is spoiled. Uh, but I'm in the industry, right? I can't feed her exclusively pelleted factory made food. You know what I mean? It's just against my principles. I mean, I, I, I don't eat that way. 
I don't want to feed her that way. So uh, I started off feeding her just normal dog food. I didn't really know any better. All of this was an evolution. You know, some of this is from doing the podcast. So one thing I love about doing the podcast, by the way, we didn't mention yours, Lisa. Oh, you yeah. You have a podcast. What's it called? I have a podcast. It's called Whole CEO with Lisa G. And I started it during the pandemic because my road uh, business has been very bumpy, like I said. And and then the pandemic happened. And I was like, how can I help other people? Because if I'm struggling, everybody's struggling. So I started launching a podcast and everybody that I spoke to over 120 people already have been like, how can I help my audience in their health, in their business, in their mindset, in weight loss with three tips on being unstoppable. So I've interviewed some mm -hmm. of the top in, um, experts in the industry in short 15 to 30 minute podcasts. And they're all just value driven on helping others be unstoppable, unbreakable, unshakable, and bounce back better from the pandemic. Well, I love that. How many episodes have you done now about? Well, I celebrated 100 like several months ago, but Holy I've been cow. putting them out like two a week for a year and four months. So well over 120 right now. Ooh, that's a lot of work. I'm, I'm a little over 200 and I started in like 2018. So uh, kudos to you. Uh, that's a, a lot, lot of work. work. Yeah, it a is. lot of work. Podcasting is fun, though, because I get to meet people like you that I would never have ever met. And, and I love that, you know, especially when I was locked up or locked down or whatever you want to call it. You know? Felt the same. I, I, I like having conversations <laughs> with people. <laughs> well, I, I, before I let you go, I know I've kept you a long time, but this has been such a, such a great conversation. You work with high performing people. That's your focus. And one of the things I can't help thinking is that, that many of the people whose simple goal at the moment is, is to lose weight, that I, I feel like sometimes I bump into people that could be thinking bigger. You come across as someone who thinks big. I do. I'm a like, dream big is one of my favorite quotes in my head. Well, and I love I that. Never and give up. And, and you know, um, I put out tons of free content, too. If I can inspire any of your audience, I'm happy to. It makes me wonder whether some of the people struggling to lose weight, you know, if maybe their vision isn't big enough, maybe part of the struggle is the only goal is to lose the 30 pounds and, and, and maybe they just don't see that there could be so much more than, than losing the 30 pounds. And um, you work with people who are in that arena, who they've lost the 30 pounds. Now they're, they're, they're achieving bigger and, and better goals. Do you think that that might be a challenge some people have is, is that they're, they're maybe not just, just not challenging themselves enough. They don't have a, a big enough vision to help them break through some of these barriers that are holding them back. Absolutely. If I could leave you with one last tip for your audience, I would say if you're not losing weight and weight loss as a goal or any goal, really, you need to have a four word vision statement. You need to be a visionary. You need to think and frame it as if it has already happened. So I am is a really powerful way to say it. Mm. At whatever your three adjectives and one noun, just for a healthy, fit, exemplary leader, just come up with four words, focus on in the morning, focus on the middle of the day, focus on them at night and never give up on your dream big goal. Give me, give me a couple more examples of that before we go. So a couple of statements that, that people may end up with, or maybe favorites from people that don't mind you sharing of, of finished thoughts that have really helped and inspired people to reach their goals. Well, I, I'd say, you know, just be a visionary, come up with your vision board. If you're real creative, like me, create a vision board of your dream life. And this is all about the laws of attraction. So you attract what you are. So you have to act as if you're already there and frame your goals as if you're already there. I am, you know, fearless, unstoppable, amazing, inspired, whatever your dream is, put it in four words. Remember it in the morning, remember it at night and once in the middle of the day, put on your phone, take a screenshot of it. And focus on your goals, focus on your dream, focus on your what, 
focus on your why, drink your water, give intermittent fasting a shot. And I see you out there. Put down that box of carbs. <laughs> Put away the box of carbs. I love that. And so the first two words, I am, don't count as the four adjective words. Yeah, like I am is just a way of framing That's it. I know the there's some beginning. religious people that don't like that. But um, from my vantage point, it's just like I am is just believing that it's already true. However, that whatever that looks like to you is just believe it as if it's already happened. And that is the law of attraction. It's interesting you mentioned that because uh, growing up in a Judeo-Christian country, you know, we're familiar with the I am strong statement from the Old Testament. And most people who went to ever went to church probably know that. And um, uh, I, I uh, um, am very interested in Buddhism. I attend a, a Sangha and I'm very interested in, in meditation and, and I go on retreats and it's a big part of my life. And uh, a person that um, a few years ago recommended, I, I also learn about Hinduism and I'm doing that now for the, finally I'm learning about Hinduism. I'm just fascinated with ancient cultures and religion and philosophy. So I'm really enjoying it. And guess what? The I am statement is not just in the old Testament. It's in the Upanishads of Hinduism and it's in Buddhism. And I find that very powerful. I, I don't find it sacrilegious to use the statement. Again, if those of you listening, I'm not trying to offend anybody at all. If you find it something you would not use and you're not comfortable with, I absolutely understand. All I'm saying, though, is that across multiple cultures and religions, I have found the statement I am to be used as a recommended form of communication and internal talk. And, and it, there's something really powerful about those words. I am... You know, this, like you said, the law of attraction, you just have this feeling of attracting something great when you fill in those words afterwards as you, as you did. So anyways, I, I think it's uh, ancient and cross-cultural, that statement. I, I just wanted to put that out there because I don't want to offend anybody. And I know yeah. I, I, my beliefs are not your beliefs. And to me, it's the law of attraction and it doesn't matter how you frame it. It's just a matter of acting as if what you want is already happening. And however you right. want to do that, put into a statement that resonates with you and something that will inspire you on fire to get up and do the hard things. Well, with that, that's a great closing statement right there, Lisa. Thanks so much for coming on the show. It's been a lot of fun to talk to you. Thanks for having me, Dave. Before we let you go, how do people learn more about you? What have you got on offer? Do you have coaching? Have you got, you know, what, what, what have you got for people who want more Lisa in their life? Well, I'm creating some new programs as soon as next week um, so that it won't be just the VIP one-on-one -on -one coaching. I'm going to create some digital and group offerings. Okay. It's all about high-performance coaching. So the best way to find me and follow me is on LinkedIn. That's where okay. I spend most of my time on social media. And you can find my website, all of my other social media is right on there. Lisa G Fitness. Lisa G Fitness. And for those of you listening, as I mentioned earlier, we'll have all this at uh, dirobi.com, D-I-R-O-B-I.com. You can click on podcast. And when we release this episode, we'll have links to Lisa's stuff and, and uh, quotes from the episode and the video and you can listen. So every which way that we can uh, give you this content, we will give it to you. So Lisa, thank you so much. It has been great talking to you and, uh, and I look forward to coming on your show. That's coming up soon. That's going to be fun. So excited. Thank you, Dave, for having me. And thanks, everybody. Thank you. And for those of you listening, this is Dave Sherwin wishing you health and success.